Welcome to the tape library. I'm going to give a really quick introduction to what this video is because it's a little different to our normal episodes. Once every few months I like to create a long form video of real life paranormal stories because I know so many of you enjoy falling asleep listening to these. Usually this is simply a compilation of the stories I featured over the last few months, but tonight is different. Since this community has started to grow so quickly, I've been sent dozens of your personal encounters, so every single story in this video will be brand new. Because these videos are designed to be relaxing, there won't be the usual visuals or music, it's a much more dialed back experience. When the stories end, I'll keep the ambient noise going for a little while longer, but I'll leave a chapter at the end, so those who aren't sleeping know when the stories are finished. There will be one short ad break after this intro, and then after that the remainder of the video, and then after that the remainder of the video will be ad free. Because of that I'd really love it if you could support the channel just by quickly hitting the like button before we get started, or if you feel extra generous then please leave a comment below as well. It really helps me reach more and more people on this site. If you haven't subscribed already then please do if you enjoy real life tales of the paranormal. We'll be back to our normal deep dives with the next episode, which is the case I think you have all requested more than any other. Okay, so let's get into this. Dim the lights and get yourself comfortable. I want you to take a moment to picture this scene with me. You wake up a little dazed and confused. You must have fallen asleep, but you don't remember where you were when you did. Your eyes blink into life, and you realise you're in a room of some kind. Alone. Wait. There's a window. It's dark out, but you can tell the world outside is moving. This isn't a room. It's a train carriage. An old-fashioned train carriage at that lit by gas lamps and old decor, much like you imagine a fancy steam train would have looked like back in the day. Suddenly there is a knock at the door of your private room. The person doesn't wait for you to respond. In walks a strange looking pale thin man in a dark suit and hat, holding a briefcase. He sits in front of you grinning, an unnaturally creepy grin as he opens the case and pulls out a series of papers. The man informs you he is a paranormal investigator. You accept this, but something about him makes you uncomfortable. Like he isn't quite there. Like he is merely attempting to portray himself as human. The man informs you that you are going to be sharing this overnight train for at least the next few hours and he would like to tell you about some of the cases he is currently working on. You agree to this purely because something inside you tells you that you don't have a choice. The man smiles that unnatural smile once again, and then glances down at his page to read Case Zero. For some background, this happened some 30 years ago now. I was living in a small little area known as Bow in Washington. My home was almost directly off of Interstate 5. You would exit the I-5 and turn left past what was a fish market, and is now nothing more than an empty lot. You would pass by woods and a single sad looking home on the right. That home was mine. Most cars passed by my house at 90 miles an hour. We often had strange people stop at our home in the middle of the night to ask for directions or pee in our yard. Yeah, it was and still is weird. The house was less than 800 square feet and in rough condition. For example, I have vivid memories of watching mice run across the floor in front of me while I lay on my belly playing with my toys. I lived there with my parents, my mother who is 5 feet and 3 and a half inches tall. And this is relevant, I swear. My father who is 6 feet 4 inches tall. My elder sister who at the time was around the height of my mother but was far bigger than she was. My mother grew up malnourished her whole life, and as a result can't keep weight on to save her soul. She spent most of her life weighing only 90 pounds. This is also relevant later in the story. I also lived with my little brother. We lived in the middle of nowhere, to the extent that seeing cougars in our backyard was 
practically normal. At the time this story took place, I was maybe seven years old. I shared a room with my little brother. The room had bunk beds that were placed directly before the bedroom door. This looked out into a very short hallway of maybe four feet. I was sleeping on the bottom bunk and woke up in the middle of the night. I rolled over and for no reason I can recall now, I looked up and out of the door to the hallway. I saw a dark, completely dark figure leaning casually against the wall just outside my bedroom door. I distinctly recall feeling amused and laughing because the figure was rail thin, short and had on a cowboy hat. The arms were crossed over the chest and the figure had the leg closest to me braced against the wall behind him. I was convinced it was my mother trying to play a game. I giggled and asked what she was doing. I don't remember my exact words at the time but I do remember calling out mummy and inquiring as to if this was a game or something. The figure's head turned to me. But again my memory gives no features. Just pitch blackness. Which should have been scary but for whatever reason I was convinced this was my mother. Then one arm came up and a single finger pressed to what should have been lips in the shushing gesture. I laughed again but lay back down and went to sleep obediently. In hindsight we are lucky this wasn't a kidnapper or murderer or something because I was a seriously stupid child. The next morning at breakfast I asked my mother about the game she was playing. She was confused. I explained what I had seen and she continued to look at me uncomprehendingly. I proceeded to drag her to the hallway and pose for her. I was seriously annoyed that she wasn't explaining. I knew she had a cowboy hat. I played with it all the time, so I was convinced it had been her. However, my mother insisted it hadn't been her. Now neither my father nor sister could have done it. The figure was too thin and small to be them. And my brother was still only five years old or so. My mum said I must have been dreaming and left it at that. However, just after I turned ten or so, we moved out of the state. For reasons I'd rather not get into, my sister stayed behind in the house. About a year after we moved, my mother got a panicked phone call late in the evening. My sister, having returned to her old family home after work, had walked into the house to find a strange, small, thin man in a cowboy hat standing in the kitchen. She ran out to her car and drove to the nearest neighbour's house to call the police. She then called my mother. The strangest part was the police never found anyone. The house had been locked when my sister returned home and there were no signs of forced entry, nor a break-in. My sister swears she saw no car near the house when she arrived. After this, my sister refused to stay in the home and moved out. Later, my mother recounted to me that my sister has always been sensitive and had even seen and spoken to her dead mother as a small child. My sister is adopted, by the way. She also mentioned that the old man who had built the home on the land that my parents bought had, according to what they had been told, been very fond of wearing cowboy hats. The house has since been torn down after a fire broke out on the property. Case 1 This took place around 2000 in Guildford, Surrey. I rented a small house there with my now ex-wife probably built in the late 18th or early 19th century. The first strange thing we noticed was in the kitchen. Sometimes if we were in there doing something and we were to leave for a few minutes, we'd return to find things had moved. This happened to both of us and at first we both just assumed it was the other or we had done it ourselves and forgotten about it. But it happened enough times that we slowly became convinced that these things were moving on their own. It was never terribly dramatic like what you see in the movies. Most often it would be dishes moved into or near the sink. Bowls, plates, cups, mugs, glasses, etc. Always neatly stacked or placed. And never anything broken. In the end it felt like we were being cleaned up after. 
On a few occasions I did a little test when my ex-wife wasn't home. I deliberately left a cutting board and knife on the dining table just to see. Nothing happened for a while until one day, having set up my little trap and left for maybe 10 minutes or so. I came back and there it was, next to the sink. I remember clearly the surreal, vaguely sinking feeling of realising it wasn't our imagination at all. This was real and I didn't have an explanation. I didn't repeat the test after that. Then there was the stairs. Sitting on the couch in the living room you could see the staircase out of the corner of your eye. And at night both of us would very frequently see movement on the stairs. It happened often enough that it would interrupt us watching TV and became a bit of an annoyance. The most significant incident for me though was one day while I was putting away dishes. The kitchen was at the back of the house with a door leading in to the living room at the front. The stairs were just through the door and on the left and turned 90 degrees before ascending. I remember I picked up a plate off the dish rack and was drying it off, and as I turned to face the doorway, I very clearly saw a woman walk past and go up the stairs. She had dark shoulder length hair and was wearing a long black skirt and white long sleeve blouse. She looked enough like my ex-wife that at first I thought it was her, and for a couple of seconds was wondering why she was dressed that way when my ex-wife suddenly walked into the kitchen and living room. I was stunned as I realised it couldn't possibly have been her. I said to her, I've just seen you go upstairs, before running up after, ready to confront whatever I now assumed must be an intruder. I searched every room, under the beds, in the wardrobes. Nothing. The woman had vanished. This wasn't a ghostly apparition or some semi-transparent shape. It was a solid person. She was moving briskly and sort of jogged up the stairs, like she had just forgotten something and was rushing to fetch it. It definitely freaked me out a bit because, again, it wasn't some shadow or shape I saw out the corner of my eye. I was directly facing her. And by the time she was on the stairs, I was looking right at her though by then she was facing away from me, so I didn't see her face. The final incident in that house happened in the early hours. I remember waking up and checking the clock, seeing that it was just after 3am, and as I rolled over I happened to glance out the bedroom door and down the hallway. There I saw a ball of light, about the size of a football, or soccer ball for the Americans. Light blue in colour, at the top of the stairs. It moved down the hallway at around chest height to the bedroom door before disappearing. It appeared free floating. It didn't reflect off anything and didn't seem to illuminate the space at all either. I stayed there awake until dawn, feeling perplexed, looking down the hallway and around the room for a source for the strange light. When I finally got up, I spent quite some time trying to find some way to rationally explain what I had seen all of the curtains were drawn and as much as I tried, I just couldn't work it out. All of this occurred within a six month period before the house was sold and we had to move out. I've never had anything like that happen before or since, just in that one house. While the things we experienced were unsettling, we were never really scared. The house didn't feel bad or foreboding. It was still a nice little house and we were sad to have to go. I was a pretty strong sceptic before living there. The experiences I had in that house have left me much more open to the idea that maybe there's more to all of this than we see. Case 2 So I want to preface this by saying I was born and raised in one of the oldest cities in the US. It has a lot of history and the paranormal has always been a part of it here. Almost all the big old plantation houses have ghost stories that almost all the locals know. I only say all this to explain that I was sort of raised to believe in the paranormal world. So my personal experience comes from when I was in my teens. 
and was definitely not a well-behaved teenager, and this night was no different. It was the summer of 2018 if I remember correctly, and my friends and I were driving a few miles outside of town, smoking weed and just being hooligans. We were all from the area and were pretty familiar with the local legends, and one of those was the story of Joe Baldwin and the Mako Light. Our town was once a very large train stop along the now defunct Atlantic coastline. The story goes that back in 1867, Joe was the flagman, the guy who worked in the caboose, and was on a train heading for town late one night when the caboose somehow became detached from the rest of the train. Shortly after, there was another train that was coming into town, and Joe, trying to alert the crew and get them to stop the train, grabs his lantern and starts waving it from the back of the caboose. But the crew never saw him, so hit the caboose at full speed, decapitating Joe in the process. So now every night, along the stretch of track a few miles outside of town, you can see a lone light, swaying, back and forth, back and forth. The unanimous verdict is that Joe is looking for his head. We didn't originally plan to come out to try and see it. Like I said earlier, we were just wanting to smoke and shoot off our guns in the woods. But after that mission was accomplished, on our way back home, one of my friends says, Yo, we're out near where the Mako light is, aren't we? None of us had ever seen it before. And of course, when one of us said, I'm going, we all had to go. So after a short five to ten minute drive, we arrived at the railroad tracks. They were no longer in use, so we just parked the car on them and all got out. We started walking towards the direction we had heard he comes from all the while acting like idiots, screaming, Joe, Joe, where are you? And many other less appropriate things. One of us fired our gun off, just being ignorant ourselves. We were walking for about 15 minutes when we had collectively decided we're not gonna see him and we're gonna head back. Just a few minutes after we started walking back, I heard a, yo, fucking look. And sure enough, there it was. A lone bright yellow light, flickering in intensity and swinging back and forth. I was awestruck. We all must have been, because we were all silent as we just watched it for a minute. I never noticed the outline of any figure, just the light itself. Still, that was more than enough for me. So that's when I said, all right, y'all, we should probably leave now. Naturally, I was met with ridicule and called a pussy. But as it got closer, I could tell their resolve was faltering too. So after a good few minutes with it getting closer to us, we started to walk away. A fast walk, mind you. Once back in the car, we kind of just took stock of the situation. One of my friends was taking videos to post about how we just saw Joe Baldwin as well as being upset that he didn't get the light on video. We decided we had done enough adventuring for one night and elected to go grab some Taco Bell and go home. Case 3 I'm 34 now, but this happened over 20 years ago when I was 7 years old. Writing this is actually really strange how many of the details I can remember, because I was only 7. Anyway, here's the story. In 1995, my Boy Scout troop took a trip to Carolina to visit a retired World War II era warship that has been permanently docked there as a museum. The ship is called USS Yorktown. In the 90s, one of the big tourist traps was visiting this museum and staying aboard the ship overnight. And in 1995, that's what my Boy Scout troop did. We spent four days and three nights on the USS Yorktown. The adults spent the night in the officers' quarters, while the children slept in the racks, designed for the enlisted troops on their way to deployment. The biggest attraction on the ship to us children was this really cool flight simulator they let us play for free. The Boy Scout troop had the run of the ship, as we were the only guests there for the long weekend. I remember it was Memorial Day, because I had just turned seven, my birthday is in May. 
All day we flew the simulated missions and had a blast. So we were unaware of the rumours going around with the troop leader's wife. However, after the first night, what happened to her, and later on to me, makes my hair stand up on end. The second day, the troop leader's wife left the ship and got a hotel room, and never came back on board for the rest of the trip. We heard that last night she had woken up to the sound of showers running. She got up to investigate and found every shower head was on, and the rest of the troop mums were sound asleep. It scared her so bad she left and never came back. On the second day we were told a story about an officer whose name I can't remember, that he had died in a tragic accident during training manoeuvres aboard that ship in the 1940s. What terrified us at this point was to learn the troop leader's wife had been assigned to his bed. She told us later she had a horrific nightmare that ended with the sound of running water. When she saw she wasn't dreaming about the showers, she bolted. I wasn't really buying it, but that's when it got weird for me. The last day we were there, I was a typical seven-year-old that's been cooped up on a warship for three days. My mum basically made me stay with her all day because I was being a nightmare. My mum had a headache, so she made me go with her to her bed in the officer's quarters so she could lay down. We got to the bed. She opened the six foot tall locker next to her bed, threw her purse inside, threw a colouring book at me and said, stay put. This is what I can't explain. I remember being seven, being upset that I couldn't play and being extremely restless. I resigned myself to the fact I couldn't go anywhere anyway, so I sat down, leaned my back against the locker and started colouring. The next thing I know, my mum is waking me up. I'm not sure if I had a weird dream or not, but what is super, super weird is the showers were on again. Not all of them, just one. At first, my mum accused me of trying to scare her, but then realised I was genuinely waking up from being asleep. I'm not sure how I even fell asleep, but that's not the strange thing. My mum turned off the shower and said let's go find my dad and my brother and get lunch. When she went to open the locker, we both got blasted in the face by the smell of Old Spice. My grandfather wears it so we instantly recognise the smell. But what the hell? I was sleeping against that locker door. Nobody could have opened it without waking me up and then the smell of the most common deodorant worn by men from that era. The final thing that really, really terrified me about the whole thing was this. My mum told me later that she had actually claimed the bed after the troop leader's wife had left. The bed she had was on the second bunk, and it was hard for her to get in it, so when the ground level bunk became available, she took it. I hadn't realised it then, but I was sleeping up against the locker of the officer who had been killed in the accident. My mum was sleeping in his bed. To this day, I've never been able to explain how the locker smelled like it had old spice in it, but when an hour earlier, when my mum put her purse in it, it didn't. Case 4 So me and my family are very spiritual, and most of my family members have some kind of third eye or whatever you call it. This means that we can sometimes see, hear, feel, and have contact with spirits or other entities. My sister was the only one who didn't really believe in demons or spirits. That being said, let me tell you a story that changed my sister's belief completely. It started when me and my family went on holiday at a time when there were a lot of people at the resort, and I met quite a few people and had fun. Everything was all fine and dandy at the resort and we enjoyed our time, but when the time came to go home, we packed up and got ready to leave. As we were packing the last bag into the car, a spider bit my sister. Luckily it wasn't a venomous one, but the bad luck basically began the moment we were about to leave. The trip home was okay, however we did see a really bad car accident that happened moments before we reached the location of it, and there was a decapitated body of a man lying in the road. After that the trip continued pretty normal. We got home and took it easy, 
It was a Sunday evening and I got ready for bed, feeling like something was off, but I brushed it off as a feeling of not wanting to go back to work the next day. I tried to fall asleep but kept going in and out of sleep, like something didn't want me to get rest. So I was extremely tired the next day when I had to go to work. I was a waitress at this time so I had to be there real early. This was the day everything started to show signs. When I got to work I was notified that I won't be having my job for much longer because they had to close down due to my boss having some life threatening disease. As the day went on I met a lot of moody customers who really did not show any gratitude or even a smile as I was carrying a tray to prepare some tables with salt and pepper shakers. I felt like I was bumped in a way as if someone walked into me full force but no one was there and three shakers fell off and crashed and broke on the floor. It was really weird, I thought maybe I was imagining it, I just tripped, so I cleaned the mess and carried on with work. A few hours later I went to clear a table for a customer so that I could bring his breakfast, and as soon as I picked up a coffee cup and saucer, the cup basically tipped off the saucer and hit the ground breaking. At this point I felt like the day was just really unlucky, and acted a lot more careful. Very close to the end of the day, my colleague was tricked by a man confusing the hell out of me and her, and stole like triple the amount of money he actually should have paid us, and she got into a lot of trouble for it. But it definitely was not our fault. I just got over it and thought the day was a really bad one. I went home after work and my entire family was in a really bad mood, all grumpy and they too had had a really bad day. So we had our dinner and basically went straight to bed after that without really conversing in any way. The night when I was in bed, I felt okay and could fall asleep easily. However, as soon as I fell asleep, I woke up in a kind of sleep paralysis. And something made some sort of growling, murmuring noise. Right next to the side of the bed I was sleeping. Suddenly I felt like something was going to snap at me or go at my face. I immediately woke up and wondered what it could have been. At this time, me and my sister shared a bed, so I looked over at her and asked if she had made the noise or heard anything. But she was fast asleep, so I thought it was just a weird dream and went back to sleep. The next day, everything was perfectly fine. No bad luck, nothing new. But everything seemed a lot more quiet and as if the world was grey but still had colour. It was a strange feeling. I got home from work and I just felt like I wasn't living in my own body, but I had control over it. So I went to bed early and fell asleep pretty easily. Now again, as soon as I fell asleep, I fell into sleep paralysis, and I heard that weird sound again from the night before. But I also felt something grabbing my arm and pulling me off the side of the bed, but I couldn't move. I eventually snapped out of it and when I did, I found myself in the exact position that I was dragged into off of the bed. Which then I freaked the hell out about because my sister next to me again was fast asleep, talking in her sleep. I didn't hear what she said but I basically got close to her, as far away from the edge of my side of the bed and cuddled her for safety. I barely got any sleep that night because I felt like something was watching me the entire time. The third day was still normal after waking up. I told my dad, who was a priest at the time, about what happened that night. And he did some kind of prayer in the room thinking it would help, because I thought it was just some kind of restless spirit who was in a bad place. Oh, how wrong we were. The day went by and the night time came. Everyone went to bed early, including me and my sister. I felt at ease, thinking the problem had gone, so I went to sleep. This time, as soon as I fell asleep, same as last, I fell into sleep paralysis, but I saw it. I literally saw a demon in front of me, moving in a glitchy way. It had no eyes, its mouth had no shape, it was just three voids on its face. It was pale, slightly shiny, but like misty. It did not look like a solid being. I could feel it. I heard the same growls and murmuring. I closed my eyes hoping it would go away but it just stood there moving weirdly. 
I tried this a few times and after like the fourth time of closing my eyes and opening it again, it appeared on top of me, like hovering above me but lowering itself onto me or more like into me. It was the worst feeling I'd ever felt in my entire life. As its face came into contact with mine, my vision started to go black. And the more it went into me, it felt like my body was melting away. But the space it was trying to occupy felt like having really bad pins and needles. But also not being able to feel or move anything. Like my body was becoming a corpse at every inch it went into me. At this point I tried yelling so bad, trying to scare it or shake it off, but nothing came out. It just could not move. At the time all this was happening, to me and my paralysis, my sister was dreaming that she was in a pitch black room, completely void, except for a red phone on a little table. It rang and she approached it. As soon as she answered it, she heard the demon's voice saying, I want Kira. Then she immediately saw a vision of what was happening to me in my dreams. According to my sister, after seeing this, she woke up in fear looked at me and I was sitting straight up, with my eyes rolled back, shaking, as if I was having a seizure. As soon as she touched me to wake me up, I screamed so loud that the neighbours even came running. I think when she touched me, it snapped me out of it, and I woke up immediately crying. And as I woke up, I remember hearing how badly I was screaming. Soon my entire family were in the room, looking like I was literally being killed. And I was just like, nope. I was speechless and couldn't even breathe properly because I was so traumatised. I still felt like it was right there by me and my dad realised it was following me and not just lingering in the house. So my dad in a way had to exercise me. I had to drink a lot of sugar water because I was extremely fatigued after that. The exorcism didn't do anything weird like you see in the movies. It just basically lifted something spiritually suffocating from my body. I felt so relieved, as if some shadow that was inside me was being sent away. I felt okay after that. I did not go back to sleep after that, and all of this happened either 15 minutes exactly before or after 3am, so I was just chilling watching TV till the sun came up. I called in sick at work and napped during the day, and finally had a peaceful time of sleep without being bothered. After my dad helped me out, I have not been bothered by this thing again, but I remember its face and voice, and it is something no one can ever explain, like there are no words that can actually describe it. My sister's memory of seeing it from our connected dream was in a way blanked out because her mind was traumatised by it, and we never spoke about it again after that. To this day I now know what it feels like to be in the process of being possessed. And when something really dark is following me or anyone else, it somehow made my third eye stronger. Anyway, I wish that no one has to experience this because of how terrifying it was. So just don't doubt what an entity from another realm can do, because it's a lot stronger than you think. Especially if you give it permission. Case 5 I wanted to share my story with you. I do have many paranormal stories, but this one caused me fear, so please bear with me. When I was a very young girl, my family, mum, dad and younger sister, lived with my great grandma. In order to visualise my great grandma's house, I'll quickly describe it to you. It was built sometime between the 1880s and 1890s. When you walked through the front door, you were in the living room, and my great-grandma's bedroom was off to the right. Walking forward, you'll find yourself in the dining room, with a half-bathroom off to the right, and about four feet from the bathroom was my younger sister's bedroom. Again, walking forward, you'll be in the kitchen, and there were stairs leading up to the attic, and there was a trap door underneath the stairs, which led into the basement. Beyond the kitchen was the old sunroom, which became my bedroom. My parents slept in the basement. As you walked down the stairs which led to the basement, 
there was the old coal storing room, which became a storage room for our toys. Going towards the left, there was a washer and dryer, a small sink, and a full-sized bathroom on the left. Walking forward, there was this small area in which my parents had a couch, love seat, and off to the left is where they slept. In my bedroom, there was an oak dresser, my mum's old Singer sewing machine, a chair, a metal cabinet that held my great grandma's sharp knives, meat tenderizer, pots and pans, and an old radiator. My sister's and my nice clothes were hanging up, which was above the chair. There was a back door that led to the backyard, which had wooden stairs. It was around my birthday in 1975, and my parents asked what I wanted to do, and I said to go out to eat and a movie at the driving theatre. Now my parents knew I absolutely loved horror movies, and they had gotten the newspaper to see what movie was playing and at what time. They had seen that the movie, The Exorcist, was going to be playing, so I asked my great grandma if she wanted to go with us, but she declined. So off we went to grab something to eat, then drive to the drive-in theatre. The movie was going to be played at 7.45pm. We get to the theatre at around 7 that night, and my sister and myself went to go and play with the swings and seesaw that the theatre provided. We played for about 30 minutes and then my mum called us to get to the car. My mum, sister and myself had gone to grab some popcorn, candy and sodas. Then the previews began. I was so excited to be watching a scary movie with my family. Halfway through the movie, my sister announces that she had to use the bathroom, so my mum took us. And as I was getting out of the car, my dad had said, You two better listen to your mother, or the devil is going to reach through the ground and snatch you. We listened. We returned back to the car and my sister had fallen asleep and my mum had covered my eyes because it was during the scene in which Reagan was using a crucifix on herself and my mum thought it was highly inappropriate for me to see. The movie ended about 10 and it took us some time to get out of the drive-in theatre and drive almost 45 minutes home. When we arrived home we brushed our teeth, put our pyjamas on, said our prayers then told my mum that we loved her and off to dreamland we went. It was pretty late when I began hearing things move around my bedroom. I kept reciting the Lord's Prayer in order to protect myself. I quickly fell into a deep sleep and before I knew it, my mum was waking us up. My mum screamed for my dad to grab his leather belt because she was going to beat my ass because my bedroom was destroyed. Thank God that my great grandma made her think before she reacted. Here's a description of what had happened. The oak dress that was about an inch away from my bed was now two feet from my bed. My mum's singer sewing machine was dragged out to the middle of the floor. Our clothes that were hung up were now all over the floor. My great grandma's dog treats were strewn all over the bedroom. The porcelain figure of the Blessed Virgin Mary's head was snapped off. The cross made from palm leaves was turned upside down. A photo of Jesus had a huge scratch across it and my great-grandma's sharp butcher's knife was lying on my pillow with the sharp edge towards my face. My great-grandma told my mum there was no way I could have done all that, and I didn't wake anyone up. My mum thought about it and agreed. My mum and myself cleaned up my bedroom, and she just held me close to her. I could feel her shaking. For the very first time, I noticed that my mum was scared for me. Things continue to happen to me as I grew up, and I do have many more paranormal stories to share, if you want to hear them. I am from the deep south in the US, and I've heard ghost stories my whole life. Maybe it's the way I look, the old southern woman that I am, but people just open up to me about their ghost stories. Maybe it's because they know on some instinctive level I will understand and not judge them as crazy or delusional. I am a true believer in the other side. Here is something that might be considered paranormal or at least strange. There was a time in my life when paranormal things seemed to swarm around me. 
I was a young girl of about 10, and I had a series of precognitive dreams. I sat down one day and decided I would try to remember the very first memory I ever had in my young life. I scrolled through memories over the years. I can remember them from a very early age and I know these memories are real. I've told my mother about these memories and she's confirmed they were right. This is the memory I had. I was riding in the back of a large car and looked out the window to my left. Across the city street was a tall building with three peaked arches carved into the architecture of the building. It was cold, raining, dark and three figures stood in front of the building under a porch that was supported by thick rods that hung from the building. A set of plate glass doors shone lights into the street behind the figures, which I took to be men who wore long coats and fedora type hats like they were waiting for a bus or something. I looked forward and saw a sheet of white. The next memory was of sitting in the back of a pickup with a bunch of other kids. I could see the back of her neck and curve of her shoulder of a short-haired woman through the truck's back window. Suddenly a car approached coming through the intersection at us and I yelled at the other kids to sit down. The next memory is of a baby floating away from me into a field of stars. Now these memories may be uninteresting in themselves, but I had them before I was born. How do I know that? The very next memory I have is of a very blurry blue vase full of yellow flowers sitting on a table in a bright room. When I told my mother about this memory, she said my father had bought her a blue vase full of yellow chrysanthemums the day I was born. The reason why my memory is blurry is because newborns can't see very well. Second memory, the one where I was sitting in the back of the truck, happened when I was 11. My family had recently moved to North Alabama from Florida and we were staying with my grandmother. My aunt and family lived in a street over from my grandmother and owned a pickup. Back in those days, in the early 70s, people didn't pay much attention to a truckload of little kids. Everybody's kids rode around in the back of pickup trucks. Anyway, we were sitting at the intersection waiting for the light. My brothers, sisters and cousins, about seven of us, were in the back of the truck. I was the oldest of the lot and sat behind my aunt. Looking through the glass, my memory of before I was born came to me. I yelled at the littler kids to sit down. I was scared we'd be hit and we'd go flying out the truck. I heard screeching tires behind me, braced myself, and saw a car had run the light and nearly hit us. I don't think my heart had ever pounded so hard. What the other two dreams mean, I can't really say. The first, though, reminds me of how men dressed in the 30s or 40s. The shapes of the coats and hats are like the fashion of that time. Maybe this is a memory of before this life. I was born in the late 50s. And the other, I can only guess what that one may mean. I wonder has anyone else in the world had memories before birth? I've tried to look up information online that deals more with reincarnation. Thank you all for your time and energy. I appreciate it. K7. For a little bit of backstory, I'm an extremely socially awkward teen who never really fit in anywhere. Because of this, I ended up bonding with my family's pet cat. This story is related to one of the said cats, that cat being named Shadow. So this happened about three-ish months ago at this point. One night I was home alone when I heard one of the cats throwing up. When I found the source of the sound, it was our oldest cat, Shadow. But unlike other times, this time he fell to his side and was howling. I will spare you the worst parts of this event, but my father ended up coming home and taking him to the vets. After a couple of tests were done, we were called in to come back to the vet office. It turned out that Shadow had lung cancer, and he had metastasized to other parts of his body. Sadly, that night, we had to say goodbye to him. After all that's happened, I was a wreck. I couldn't focus on anything. I was like a zombie just stumbling about. Shadow, the cat, had been in my life since I was born. It wasn't until a few days later where I had an experience, which I believe was him. I apologise for having to add so much detail, but here is the actual event. 
I was in the kitchen filling a cup of water. I hated being in that room because that was the room where everything had happened. As I finished filling my cup, I turned and as bright as day I saw a shadow walk out of the room. He started right where it happened and he walked out the doorway leading to the garage. And as I saw him, my eyes watered up because there was no mistaking him for the other cats. He had a unique look to his tail. It always was bent slightly downwards when he walked, but the very end hooked upwards. I know I saw his tail. I think that was him showing me that he was happy and was moving on. Ever since that day, the grey cloud over my head lifted and I was able to move on and return to normalcy. I just wanted to share my story with someone who is used to ghost stories. Because around where I'm from, most people don't believe in the supernatural. Case 8 This isn't really a scary story, but it's definitely disturbing. We lived on the third floor of a three-decker apartment. The neighbours below us were older types who tended to go to bed by 8pm. I was a night owl and usually stayed up later, and overall it was very quiet. When I was 17, my mother got a job working overnight at the same place my stepfather worked. She had trouble reading the schedule sometimes, and came home more than once after they both left for the night, because it turned out she didn't actually have to be there. I was up late one night after they left for work watching TV, and playing on my computer for a bit before going to bed. I heard the door open and laughed, because obviously my mother had messed up her schedule. Did you read the schedule wrong again? I asked as I shut down my computer, because I wasn't really allowed on it after a certain time. There was no answer. I thought maybe she didn't hear me, so I went out to see her, and there was no one there. I checked the door, it was locked, dead bolted and all. I think maybe I just missed her hurrying to the bathroom or something. But the bathroom door was open and the room was dark and empty. I started freaking out, got the biggest knife off the knife block, and started checking every single room, turning on every light as I went. I looked in closets and under beds, but there was nothing. I was alone in the house. I checked outside for my mother's car even though I knew it wouldn't be there. I was right. I was completely alone, but I know I heard the door open and close. It made a very distinct sound. I told my mother about it the next day, leaving out my knife adventures, and she said I probably heard one of the neighbours moving around. It was after 11pm though. There was no way one of them was making noise that could imitate the sound of our door closing and opening. My mum knew I low-key believed in the paranormal and told me I was just scaring myself and to stop. I'm not the only one who had an experience in that house though. My stepfather said he heard voices all the time when he was alone. But he was a drug addict and alcoholic, so his word isn't really reliable. My mother had an experience once as well though. She had just gotten home from dropping off my stepfather at work. I was asleep and it was almost midnight. She was sitting on the couch watching TV when she heard footsteps in the kitchen. She thought it was me leaving my room to go to the bathroom and ignored it. The way the apartment was laid out, she could see the bathroom door from where she was sitting, and she never saw me go into it. But she kept hearing footsteps. Finally, she said, What are you doing? No answer. She stood up to check the kitchen, and it was empty. She went to look in my room. I was fast asleep, and clearly hadn't moved recently. She went back to the couch, and again, she heard footsteps. She had her phone in her hand and was ready to run out and call the cops while leaving me behind, yes. But the footsteps eventually stopped. She calmed down and went to bed. When she told me about this, years later after she thought I would be over such childish things, like believing in ghosts, she admitted she didn't know what could have caused the footsteps, and floated the idea that it was just footsteps from the neighbours echoing. 
but we both knew that was a weak explanation. It has been 10 years since I moved out of that apartment and into my own place, and these stories are still vivid in my mind. Nothing ever tried to hurt us there. It was like they were just living their lives around us. Maybe they didn't know they were dead, and they were just continuing on with their business like it was just another day. I don't know. My mum and stepfather moved five years ago, and I'm glad I never have to go back to that place. Case 9. I work for a justice organisation. We're like security officers, but for the government. For legal reasons, I obviously cannot say what we are or who we are, but we're in charge of protecting government officials and leaders, visiting dignitaries and royalty, as well as justice representatives such as the Justice of the Peace, lawyers, etc. We are peace officers, which is like a private police force, but only on specific land and property. A lot of, if not most of our buildings are very old, such as old jails converted into powerhouses, law courts and the like. Almost all of us have experienced paranormal activity, such as children laughing in the middle of the night, when we're patrolling the basement washrooms, to demon blobs caught on camera coming out of elevator shafts, and our fancy man, a spirit in a top hat that wanders the hall of our main building, caught on camera opening a rotating door and walking down the hall, and the white lady in the library. But this email is about my own experiences at work, though I've had many in my own home that were just as chilling as well. My story from personal experience occurred in the archival building. It houses the historical archives for the city, as well as the current population statistics and histories, events and even old war letters from both world wars. There are washrooms on all four floors, but I always chose the washroom that was in the middle of the main stairwell between the main floor and the basement. You have to go down two large stairways, the first descending to a westward facing foyer, with large glass entrance doors that exit onto a main road, then down a second flight to another landing where the washroom is, and a maintenance and electrical room across from it on the landing. I was working with my regular partner, and another officer who I won't lie, absolutely hates both my partner and I. She's a very stern woman who lacks any semblance of a sense of humour. My partner was in the control room monitoring our alarm systems with our friend at the main security desk reading the book. It was roughly 3am and I let my partner know I was going to go to the washroom. It gets cold here in the winter and the main floor washrooms are beside our handicapped door that has a notorious air leak. So I descended the stairs to the larger washroom on the west side between both floors. I got into the stool and sat down to do my business. Now you have to understand, old buildings here have very large, very heavy, very loud doors. And this washroom was old. It had three stools that end against the wall, and I had chosen the first stool closest to the door. I heard nothing, but suddenly felt that something was not right. Sitting up, I listened a moment, then heard a loud footstep right beside my stool. No one could enter the washroom without the door squeaking like a trapped herd of rats, and banging closed even when held onto. I looked down in surprise and saw no boots, but rather a shadow, as if someone was standing right against the stall door. The footsteps started up again, and I watched two shadowed feet walk past my stall, past the next and towards the wall. Momentarily frozen in fear, I was briefly thankful I was already on the toilet before leaping to my feet, getting my gear back on and throwing open the stall door, searching the washroom and all three stalls. I even checked the ceiling, which was cement, not tiles. And there was no one. And if it was someone, they would have had to go past me again to leave, which did not happen. I calmed my nerves and figured maybe I'd been working too many night shifts in a row and started washing my hands when a blood-curdling scream shattered the air. It sounded like a woman shrieking for help and it sounded like it was right behind me. I'm not ashamed to admit I nearly leapt out of my boots and was very dumb with the washroom, bolting out and up the stairs at top speed to the west doors, pausing to calm myself 
and try to think on this rationally. Maybe someone is outside in danger, I thought. So I unlocked the door and stepped outside, looking up and down a very dead, very quiet city, confused and still trying to convince myself I was working too much. I closed and locked the door and went up the stairs to the main floor and the security desk a few feet away, seeing our friend still relaxed back reading her book. Hey, do you know where that scream came from? I asked her, knowing it was loud enough that she and my partner could not have missed it. She gave me a sour look and said, What scream? I said, The woman screaming for help just a moment ago. It echoed. Your book can't be so enthralling that you missed it. Again I was given a sour look and she graciously told me there was no scream and promptly told me where to go and how to get there. Knowing my partner had to have heard it or seen something on the camera, I went to the control center, directly behind the security desk, and took my seat. My partner welcomed me back, but paused when he saw me, asking if I was feeling okay, as I looked extremely pale. I asked him if he heard a scream or saw anything on the camera. He said no. All he heard was our friend turning her pages but had seen me looking out the west doors, appearing rather flustered. I told him what happened, and to my surprise, he had a similar incident a few months back in the East Washroom that had him run around the whole building, even calling for backup, only to find nothing. After that, we decided to brave the frostbite on the main floor washrooms, and have heard others with similar instances from the same washrooms, and even the basement stacks. All of us have seen and heard strange things, but due to the possibility of being considered mentally unfit, a lot of police, paramedics, fire services and peace officers will keep their stories between themselves. I can promise though, many of us have stories that will terrify you. Some things even follow us home, but that's for another time I think. Case 10 I was born in the Philippines. My family was Catholic and as one might expect very religious. My father used to tell me ghost stories by the sofa in our living room during Halloween just to give me a scare. He'd tell me the legends and myths about all manner of creatures that could be found here in our country. Back then I believed him and I was almost scared of all the stories I'd heard from him. I was a kid back then, so of course it's easy to scare a kid. One day I was out with my friends. We were playing by the trees near my house. I lived in a rural area, so of course it wasn't actually that close by, but we still go there often. We played hide and seek. I sucked at this game due to the fact that I picked the worst spots to hide. I saw a tree near the bushes just about 30 steps from where the seeker was. I hid in it thinking I couldn't be caught. I stayed quiet as the counting went down to one. I kept to myself and didn't even bother to look around. But after a while, out of curiosity, I checked and I was jump scared by my friend, the seeker, who had been behind me for the last 30 seconds. I got angry that I got caught so easily. I started stomping on this huge lump of ground to release my fit of anger. And after a while, I joined my friend in finding my other pals. After that we all went home, it was late in the afternoon and I was tired, so I ate and my mother gave me a bath. I slept that night in peace. The next day I remember waking up dizzy and feeling really sick. One of those days where you wake up and you feel as if there's something stuck in your throat. I remember telling my parents about it and of course they immediately took care of me. A few days had passed and my fever still hadn't gone down. They took me into a nearby healthcare centre to get me checked up, but the doctors there told my parents it was just a cold and gave them a list of medicines so we could buy. That night as I was laying down, I felt the need to stand up and go to the bathroom to take a piss. So I went downstairs slowly since my head was still a bit dizzy. And I remember that once I made my way to the front of the bathroom, I saw something. Something in the shadows was clearly moving. I couldn't make out what it was. 
I slowly turned the lights on and there was nothing there. Then I felt a tickling feeling in my left foot. I remember lifting it up to scratch it, only for the tickling feeling to intensify to such a point where I couldn't help but laugh. My mother woke up due to my laughter and came down. She was pretty disturbed by the sight of me laughing to nothing. And she disregarded it and assumed I was delirious due to my sickness. She quickly pulled me in her arms and carried me back to bed. Of course, I wet the bed that night. A day had passed and my fever had gotten worse. At this point they were deeply concerned. We used to do this thing where we put our hands together and if one of our hands was bigger than the other, it meant we disturbed the spirit. To no surprise, my parents saw that my right hand was bigger than my left by just a few centimeters. This immediately made them go seek a medium. The medium conducted a few readings on me and then put a wet kind of like paper material to my forehead. He let it stay there for a couple of seconds before pulling it out. And there it was, clear as day. A tall cloudy figure could be seen carved into the wet paper with a little bit of horn sticking out of its head. The medium's face was shock and pale. He uttered the words, it's dark elf. He then proceeded to do a seance to relieve me of the spirit that latched on. He immediately told my parents the reason for the dark creature's presence. I vaguely remember him telling my parents that it was due to me destroying its home. That night my father went to work and I was home alone with my mother. I was still very much sick. My mother put me to bed and tucked me in. It was hot that night. The lights were on and as I drifted to sleep, I saw a vision where I was in a dreamlike state once my eyes were closed. There, next to the electric fan, was this dark creature. It was small, it had no eyes, no mouth, just a figure of something humanoid. It slowly approached me one step at a time. Each step it took it grew larger and more crooked in its appearance. Two red eyes slowly formed on what seemed to be its face. It pointed its shadow-like fingers to me and said, I will never leave you alone. I woke up soon after that, panting and sweating. I immediately told my mother and she was horrified. She immediately hugged me and begged the creature to leave me alone. I couldn't remember much of what happened after that. I'm 17 now, but I still remember that thing as clear as daylight. Every single family member of mine knows this story, but at some point they all seem to have forgotten about it. I never did. Sometimes when I'm all alone, I feel a presence lingering. It's as if I'm being watched. Whenever I'm furious, I get dark thoughts about wanting to kill somebody, anybody. And after quarantine, whenever I've suffered from something, be it physical, emotional, mental pain, I'd always laugh as some sort of coping mechanism. I don't usually chalk all this up to something supernatural, and it would be presumptuous for me to believe that the thing seriously kept its promise. But deep down a part of me knows and is aware that it never left me. It stuck onto me. It's as if it wanted some sort of payment for what I did. My ignorant act of destroying its home long ago Gave it enough reason to move in with me, or maybe move into me. I wish it had left, I truly do. Case 11 I've not really shared my two little stories with many people, because I always felt people wouldn't believe me anyway. But I'd like to first say that in general I don't consider myself a believer. I don't believe that the soul is anything more than the sum of your upbringing, experiences, and a very unique brain chemistry. But I experienced two slightly weird occurrences. The first one happened in my childhood home. I was 14 or 15 in my room together with my best friend. I had a sort of outdated PC at the time, mid 2000s, which still had a set of speakers in the left and right of the monitor. My best friend noticed the whispering coming from the speakers. We were a little bit freaked out, but we were aware that occasionally radio signals or even flight radio transmissions could be picked up on these. 
so we were a bit spooked, but still very much convinced it was just that. We turned the speakers a little louder, and the whisper disappeared. We laughed it off and just went on doing what we were doing. Next to my bed, I had an alarm with a built-in radio. Nothing fancy. It showed a digital clock, bleeped for alarms, and had a radio built in. Next thing we both know, the thing cracked loudly, and as clear as day, slightly distorted, as if it had come through a walkie-talkie. We heard a voice say in German, We can see you. We booked it out of the room, and I ended up moving into a different room in the house, because I couldn't forget it for the longest time. And the second experience happened after I graduated from secondary school. I was 19 at the time and doing a so-called voluntary year of social service, because I didn't really know what to study or what to do in my life yet. In the hospital where I worked, there was another 19-year-old who was doing the same as me. As part of that year, we were also sent to attend little weekend seminars to learn about different aspects of social work and caregiving. One evening at one of those, my colleague and me were sitting in a little lounge room, just talking, when the lady who was our coordinator at the hospital, quite tall, long blonde hair, leaned over my shoulder and said, Hey guys. Is the hospital crew having a bit of a get-together? Don't stay up too long. I turned my head and said, yep, no worries. We need to find no one there. And my colleague being like, who are you talking to? We got back to work the following Monday and learned that she had died in a car wreck that weekend. Case 12. This story is not one I simply share, mostly because it isn't something you share with anyone. I was in my first year of college, and I had always been more of a shy person and didn't like large groups. So I knew when it came time to go to college, I wanted a smaller one. I made my friends and had my groups, partied hard and didn't study at all. Yes I know, not the smartest thing to do. Now after hearing about the school I would be going to, I had heard it was haunted, but never believed it. I'd always said, it's simple. If I haven't seen it, I don't believe it. My college was small and the main building was an old mansion in Vermont. The mansion was up on a hill and down below were the dorms, gymnasium and student center. This was a relatively small area and I was quite content with the overall layout. I had been at the college for a few months and had continuously heard stories about the hauntings. None of this registered and it started to get annoying. One night my friends and I wanted to go up to the mansion and explore. I admit I had an urge to simply check out the mansion at night. All the stories I'd heard, all the encounters, all the suspicions. So one night a group of friends and I went up to play sardines. This is a simple game based on hide and go seek. Everyone hides and there's one seeker. Once someone is found, then the two search for the others hidden. So eventually the more people found, the more people to help find others, until it's everyone trying to find the last person. A group of us went up to the mansion at night and started to play the game. The mansion is three stories. A couple of us went down to the basement and figured we could try to hide down there. The mansion was old and the basement was made out of rock and limestone. There was a cavity in the basement excavated but blocked off, revealing a large and endless tunnel. No one had ever really wanted to go down it, but my friends and I didn't want to either. It was next to a large steel door that was a boiler room, and always locked. We bypassed that area and wanted to hide somewhere else. Eventually we were found and finished up the game. As we walked by the boiler room door again towards the stairs to get back upstairs, I was with three of my friends. I glanced at the door again and noticed it was open a crack. This was odd. There was a large black handprint on it. One that looked like it was placed and then wiped. It was like tar. I figured that someone we were playing sardines with had access to the area and opened it and put that handprint there. I didn't think much of it after that. 
Once the game was done, a few of my friends wanted to explore more, so everyone other than me and two friends left the mansion. I knew the building used to be a summer house for the original owner and a beautiful mansion. We had a library in the building and I knew there was probably some books on the mansion itself in the original layout. We found a few books with pictures and info showing how the mansion looked decades ago. There were also reports of deaths and hauntings in the mansion. Again, none of this I believed. To me, it was just all people over-exaggerating. My friends and I decided to explore and see what we could find. The library was on the first floor along with the Grand Hall room, the Dean's office and the theatre, and a couple of classrooms. There is an area on the end of the building with a long hallway, windows on the left side and four rooms on the right, with one at the end of the hall. These, according to the books, used to be bedrooms. I knew the hallway. My English class was in the room at the end of the hall. We walked down the hallway and wanted to look into each room. As we started down the hallway, I felt as if I could hear breathing. The kind of breathing that one does as they sleep. I quickly chalked it up to being my friends and the implanted thoughts after reading the books on the mansion. None of these rooms had doors, so we planned to simply look into each room and see if anything was off. The first room was slightly down the hall and seemed no different than the others. We walked into the room and immediately there was a cold, raw feeling. Not wind, just cold. It felt as if you'd opened a freezer and stepped inside. It happened as soon as you crossed the threshold into the room. I looked around and thought, okay, it's November in Vermont. It's chilly at night. Obviously no big deal. Windows were shut, but it's an old mansion. Who knows how the foundation is? Who knows how the temperature can be in here? We moved on down the hallway and the breathing sounds I had heard before, I didn't hear again. The same for the coldness in the first room. So I didn't think anything of it other than the fact that that room wasn't well insulated. We got to the room at the end of the hall, that was my English classroom, and nothing happened. My immediate thoughts were, yeah, this is all just bullshit. We turned and headed back down the hallway, passing the rooms I had already passed. When I passed the cold room again, I heard a slight giggle. It sounded like a young child. I dismissed it because my two friends didn't react. No acknowledgement. After reading the books, the histories, and the stories, my mind was just playing tricks on me. We then went up to the second floor. This is the floor where all the professors had all their offices along a long hallway, professors' doors across from each other, a couple of bathrooms and a classroom. This classroom used to be the kids' playroom, and the professors' rooms were maid quarters, according to the history of the mansion. A maid had allegedly hung herself in the kids' playroom from the rafters. Moreover, the ceiling had been painted over and over, but would apparently change to red after a while. No matter how many times it was repainted, it would just turn red again. Bullshit. I didn't believe this shit. I had a class up there and never saw anything. Never heard anything. Never felt anything. Other than, damn, I don't want to be in school. I never thought twice. We made our way up to the second floor and were right at the playroom. The playroom was at one side of the hall, and at the other end was another set of stairs, so we planned to just go from one side to the other. We entered the playroom and it was a typical classroom setup. Desks, chalkboard and whiteboard, nothing too exciting. This room was unique. It was a half round room. It had three windows half windows, the upper half. All three had drapes and every time I was in the classroom they were all always open or all always closed. I looked up at them and noticed that the drapes were drawn on two but not on one of them. The one to the left the drapes were open and the other two were drawn. It was odd. I kept wondering why that one wasn't drawn. 
As I glanced from left to right a couple of times, I said out loud to my friends, Hey guys, how come these two windows have drapes drawn but this one? All of a sudden, I lost my breath. I couldn't speak. I just stood there, standing and staring, looking, contemplating on what I thought I saw. I tried to figure out what was going on in my brain. What was I seeing? When I finally regained my consciousness, I knew what I was seeing. It was all too clear. In the bottom right corner of the far side left window, I saw a silhouette of a young girl looking in the window from the outside. I was on the second floor. There is no way someone could do that. She was blonde with a white coloured dress, bold eyes and what looked like shadow around the eyes. I got a good look but it didn't fully register. I stood there and stared for what I thought was minutes but probably was only 8 seconds. I said yo yo guys, guys, and turned to them. I got their attention and pointed and turned. Look, look do you see that? She was gone. My friends looked at me and asked, what? I had no words. I knew what I saw but I couldn't explain it. It took a moment before I asked what again. I started to tell them what I saw and before I could finish we heard the pitter patter of running and giggling. We all stopped. My friend said, wait, did you hear that? I knew I heard it but didn't know what it could be. I was still trying to wrap my head around what I saw. I acknowledged that I heard and was trying to look around to see if I could find where those voices were coming from. I walked towards a sound of giggling and it seemed it was coming from the bathrooms on the other side of the wall of this room. As I moved closer towards the sounds, my friend said, Holy fuck. I turned and he said I just saw what looks like a girl in the window. I froze and didn't have enough time to tell him what I had seen. He looked like all the blood had run from his face. It was all white. Then we hear the giggling again. Giggling and running. I had no idea what was going on. I was still baffled by him seeing exactly what I did before I could even tell him. My other friend tuned in now and said he heard the giggling. And I felt as if someone was watching him. He was uncomfortable. He hadn't seen what my other friend and I had saw, but he looked scared. He said we should leave and we started down the hallway past the professor's offices to the stairs at the far end. We followed, knowing we should probably go. My friend was ahead of me and my other friend was behind me as we walked down the hallway. My friend was at the end and at the stairs and turned around to see us following. His eyes bugged out. He looked as if he was seeing something behind us. I turned around and right behind my other friend was a large black silhouette of a form. It moved slow right behind us, then it slowly moved from one side of the hall to the other. I saw a form, a form of a person. I saw shoulders and head and swinging arms. I bolted past him to see what it was, but there was nothing. I know I saw something. I went by him and noticed it was right by a professor's door. Across the hall was another door. I checked the doors. Locked. Something walked right by my friend and went through a locked door. I knew it was there. I pushed my friend and said we need to get out. My other friend that was down at the end of the hall was still in shock. And I said to him we need to go and he snapped out of his daze. We went down the stairs and left the mansion back to the dorms. When we got back, my friend didn't want to talk about it, but I needed to know what my friend saw. He told me he saw a small blonde girl and a black mass right behind me. He said the girl was grinning and the black mass slowly moved from one side to the other. At this time, there were too many things to ignore, too many things I couldn't write off. We wrote to ghost hunters, telling them that our college was haunted and they needed to check it out. We got no response. 
Ten years later, ghost hunters went to our college. The normal sightings are told to the crew, but nothing of what my friend and I saw. But in that episode, ghost hunters captured on camera exactly what we saw. One of the strangest things was that when we told the story years later to others that went to the school, as soon as we mentioned the handprint on the boiler room door, many others had seen that. No one had keys. No one could get into that room. And the handprint would always disappear. Case 13 There's this incident that occurred when I was 10 years old that I remember very vividly, even 16 years later. You'd never guess that an atheist material scientist who has dedicated her life to science would believe in anything remotely paranormal. I've always followed this logic. We can only perceive 1% of the universe. Most likely even less than that. Who knows what exists alongside us that we can't see or sense. There has to be plenty of other things coexisting with us. The universe is too big and diverse for us humans to be so isolated. Personal philosophy aside, this experience I had as a 10 year old child solidified my mindset and hasn't changed since. When I was in the fifth grade, I would go to bed at 9.30 p.m. on weeknights. My parents would tuck me in, tell me goodnight, and then close my bedroom door and then do the same with my younger brother in the next room. Though I never actually went to sleep at this time, I always stayed awake a little longer than 9.30. It took some time for my body to become tired enough to fall asleep. I became accustomed to sitting in the silent blackness of my room at night, eyes wide open, until I finally succumbed to sleep. One night the bedtime routine occurred like any other night. Both my parents told me good night, then they closed my bedroom door. I stayed awake in the pitch black darkness of my room for at least 10 minutes. My eyes adjusted to the darkness, and I sat there awake, waiting to become tired enough to fall asleep for real. I tried to close my eyes for a bit, hoping that I'd be able to drift off to sleep, but I was still wide awake. I opened my eyes again and turned my attention to the end of my bed. The shape of a person, a perfect silhouette stood at the foot of my bed. I didn't feel panic at first. I thought one of my parents had come back to my room to check on me. I opened my mouth to say, Mum? Or Dad? To ask whichever one of them it was and why they had come back to my room. But a realisation stopped me from speaking. I remember that both my parents closed the door when they left my room originally. And the door was still closed. Neither of my parents were in my room, and my brother was fast asleep in his room. Who or what was in my room with me? The figure seemed to be orange in colour, almost like it was making its own light, enough that I could see what colour it was. Though the thing was human shaped, it had no human like features, no face, hair or details, just colour, and an odd fuzzy, staticky form, almost as if it was made of TV static, for as much static that composed this human shaped thing, it was dead silent and stock still, no communication or bodily movement, no threats of harming me either, despite how panicked I felt, I felt oddly connected with its presence, all it wanted to do was watch me. I don't know how I knew it was watching me, but gut feeling told me that it was staring straight at me. I stared back at this human shaped thing for some unknown amount of time. It felt like an eternity though. Hours. But I couldn't stare it down all night. Eventually I became so exhausted that I fell asleep. But when I woke up there was no trace of the figure anywhere in my room. I told my parents that morning before I had to catch the school bus, but they didn't believe me. They told me it was just a trick of the eyes, but I refused to believe that was it. Over the next 16 years, I never saw the orange static figure again. As I grew up, I got more questions than answers. Why was this human-shaped thing watching me? Was it a ghost or spirit? Was it a demon? 
Why did I only ever see it once in my life? Was it trying to tell me something? I never got any answers. I can only guess as to what it was I saw or why. Case 14 I have always been a believer in the paranormal. Me and my other family members have always been gifted, as some people would say. I've had several encounters, but two stand out to me, and I don't think I'll ever forget them. When I was younger, maybe eight or nine, my family used to own a big bit of property, thanks to my grandmother. It was a big and beautiful four-story house with a basement and attic to boot. In my grandmother's memory, we didn't redecorate or remove anything from the house. It seemed disrespectful in our culture to get rid of a deceased family member's items, and we opted for making an altar of sorts to pay our respects. I have always seen shadows in the house, heard scratching in the rooms, mainly in the card room that was there. To get to the card room, you would need to walk down this horribly long hallway, no windows, no other doors except for the one at the end and only one very old light that we couldn't figure out how to change. One night me and my brothers were playing hide and seek and knowing how terrifying the card room was, I had figured I could hide in there to win. So I braved it and started walking down the hallway. But halfway into it, the light that was always dim had dimmed even more. I felt cold and like I was being pushed towards the card room. I stumbled around attempting to get out of the hallway, but it wasn't any use. By the time I'd reached the card room I was shaken up, but that had only been the beginning. In sheer stubbornness I decided to still go through with my plan to hide in the card room, the closet specifically. But once I was in the closet, I felt like I wasn't in the house anymore, like I wasn't in this world. Somehow I ended up outside. I was walking around. I saw an old man who was sitting on a bench. We sat and talked for a few minutes before he told me it was time to leave. I needed to be found, but I was tired and begged for a nap. I woke up in my bed, my mum sitting beside me and my brother sitting on the floor. I wasn't gone for a few hours. I was gone for a whole day. When I asked about the man I talked to, Everyone was confused. Years later I brought it back up to my mum in a passing conversation and she told me of my brother's version of events. I made it to the card room and hid in the closet. But when he opened the door to say he found me, I didn't respond. Instead I slowly stood up, walked away, walking through the house and outside, down to the part of the property we weren't allowed to go to. It went downhill and with me needing a walking cane, it was off limits. My brother tried to get me to come back, but I wouldn't respond. I walked completely off the property and into the forest behind our house. He left with my stepdad to find me. They eventually found me asleep in the town's graveyard, right next to my recently passed grandpa's grave. Yeah, I was talking to my dead grandpa. And I still think that if he hadn't have stopped to talk to me and let me sleep, I would have walked into the river that ran through the cemetery. A good few years later, I was maybe 14 when this one takes place. We had rented out an apartment to stay in, and I had a small fluffy dog named Coco Coconut. She was a very shy and timid thing, even when she was a puppy. I remember loving her because she always loved to be around me, so we'd often sleep together. One night around 3.30 in the morning, I woke up to her barking. It wasn't unusual. She learned to wake me up when she needed to go outside. Once I opened my eyes, I felt like I couldn't breathe. There was a weight on my chest. And that's when I noticed it. In the upper corner of my room, there was a dark mass. It was darker than the night in my room. I stared at it, struggling to breathe and I watched as it lunged at me. My whole body felt weighed down like I couldn't move. It felt like I was like that for hours, but it was probably only a few minutes. I slept in the living room that night, 
and I haven't seen that thing since. Case 15. First, when I was a little kid, my family moved into a haunted house. I don't know why the house was haunted. The house was brand new as far as I know. No one died there. I think my older sister may have gotten into the occult for a time, so that could have been why. In any case, every night for a long time, I used to experience a pale, bald, middle-aged man walking into my room and just staring at me angrily. I told my parents about it, and one time in art class, I even painted a picture of the man, which some of the other kids' mums said creeped them out. Eventually, my family moved away from that house, and I never saw the creepy man again. I did have one more possible encounter with that ghost years later, though, but I'm not sure if it was the same ghost or not for reasons that will become apparent once I tell the story. So the house I lived in for the longest time growing up was an old fixer-upper, that had been built in the 1920s. Surprisingly, I have almost no ghost stories from that house, other than my closet in the bedroom, which was a walk-in closet. That closet had a trap door in the ceiling that led to the attic, and my family never used the attic because it was honestly kind of creepy. But whenever I was in the closet, I felt watched. One night after listening to Breaking Benjamin for a few hours in my room, I decided to go to bed. I said my nightly prayers, then closed the door to my bedroom and went to sleep. I distinctly remember that I closed the door, because my door had been broken for a really long time, and so I hadn't been able to close it, and this is one of the first nights where I could close it again. I had this really weird dream where my best friend at the time, a black boy who we would call Nathan for the sake of the story, was standing in the doorway with the door open, so I sat up in bed and asked what he was doing. To which he said, Kevin, let me in. I laughed and said, what are you talking about bro? And he got angry and started shouting, let me in, let me in. At which point his hair was gone and he started to look more and more pale and taller. A lot like the man who had haunted me as a little kid. Then the dream me shouted at him, I command you to leave in Jesus Christ's name and the thing that had been pretending to be Nathan screamed and disappeared. At which point I woke up in real life, and it was light out. But the weird thing is, the door was now open. To be fair, it could have just been a weird dream, and maybe my mum had opened the door to check on me, and then forgot to close it. But it still seems really weird. Another spooky ghost story that happened to me was when I was probably around 10. It was the middle of summer break, and I'd be hanging out in our basement on my computer all day so I decided to see if my dad would want to go to the park. We used to like to walk to this one park that was close to our house and had a tire swing. The park is right near the Vancouver School of Arts and there's a dirt track there. Anyway, I was on the tire swing and had my dad pushing it faster and faster and was really having fun. Then I saw what looked like a man walk up to the tire swing. This wasn't unusual. Oftentimes, other dads would come and ask if their kids could go on the tire swing with me because my dad was so good at getting it going really fast. But most kids were too shy to ask themselves. But what was weird is this guy just stood there for a really long time. Then at some point when I was going around the loop, it's like this guy was suddenly right on top of me. Like he was standing over the tire swing looking down at me somehow. But he had no face. It's just like a shadow, but three-dimensional somehow. I got really creeped out and had my dad stop the swing. As soon as it stopped, I could see that there was no one else at the park. I mean, no one. Just my dad and I. There was a woman in tight shorts and a bicycle riding man, but both, both of them were down on the hill on the dirt track I mentioned. At the actual playground, it was just my dad and I. There was no way there could have been anyone by the tire swing. Still, I asked my dad who the man was and he said, There's no one here. I asked if we could leave and we did. I never went back to that park until I was a teen, when I would go there to work out. But I always stayed far away from the tire swing. Another creepy ghost story that happened to me and my wife was when we visited the Winchester Mystery House. Now, my wonderful wife has actually managed to get us tickets to what's called the Explore More Tour, which I highly recommend. 
I'm kind of a nerd and I've been on the Winchester Mystery Tour several times. I really enjoy it. Just the architectural weirdness alone is fun. But I also have a fascination with the paranormal. So I've always been very interested in the story of the house too. However, I've never had any spooky encounters there. Until this time, that is. So we did the normal tour first. Then we came back for the Explore More tour. And let me just say, the EMT was so awesome. We had a great time. However, when we got to the basement, I was taking pictures with my phone. And I noticed that the facial recognition box turned on in one dark corner of the basement. No one was standing there, so I took a few more pictures. Then got kind of separated from the group because I was trying to see what my camera was saying was a face and wasn't finding anything. So my wife Cheryl comes up and says she wants me to take a picture in this one corner, but doesn't tell me why. So I go over to the corner and it's really cold. The facial recognition thing comes up again, but again I see nothing. So I took a photo, looked at it, didn't see anything, and then realised the tour group had actually moved on to the large boiler exhibit. So I walked through an adjoining hallway to link up to the group. Cheryl saw me walking up and got really confused and asked where I came from. So I said the corner and pointed and she looked really surprised. After we left the tour we went to a nearby diner to have supper and Cheryl explained the reason she had looked so shocked was that when she was in the corner it didn't look like there was an adjoining hallway and since she was so creeped out she had actually wanted to get away from the corner and felt trapped there so she would have noticed if there was a hallway right there. It was just a huge black wall. Her story and the fact that the hallway had been there for me but not for her was so weird that I shared the story on a paranormal board on Facebook with the picture I took in the corner, explaining that I didn't see anything in the photo. I got a bunch of comments asking who the man in the photo is. I looked again and sure enough, there is in fact a very angry looking face close to the centre of the frame in the photo. K16 I live in a town called Santa Quinn that ironically was Native American burial grounds before Mormons moved in. Long story short though, Google doesn't say this. The town members nicknamed it Helltown for some time till they named it after an Indian chief's son. Fast forward away to modern days and a good portion of the town is spooky especially older parts of the town. My big three parts took place at two of my jobs and a place called the Family Tree Diner. The place always had good food and it always had a good atmosphere. Well, my family stopped eating there, so I haven't been in a while. Apparently that place was a hot spot for paranormal stuff, especially near closing time. There were quite a few shows and articles about this. There were spirits in the building that would actually follow the owners and workers home and attack them at their own houses. In some cases, spirits would end up staying at the person's house. My personal experiences take place at the places I worked. The first one was at Santa Queen, a fast food place also on Centre Street, and I think as old as the family tree. But when I started there, it didn't seem all that bad, especially for a first job. One day I was asked if I would go down into the basement to work boxes, to put stuff away and make it look organised. I figured it would be easy, so I popped in my earbuds and started listening to music I liked, but I had it turned up a little louder than I was used to. I didn't mind it that much though, because I knew I was going to be busy for a good while. After a few boxes in, clear as day over my music, I heard a little girl giggle. I dropped the box I was breaking down and flipped around when I heard the girl, but no one was there. I stayed still for a bit waiting to hear something else, but I didn't. So I put my earbuds back in and tried not to pay mind to what had just happened. But I stayed on edge. A little while later, I had all of the boxes put away, and I started breaking them down. When I saw a woman staring at me through one of the shelves, her face was pale with black blemishes on her cheeks and forehead. I let out a yell and looked right at her, just for her to disappear. I immediately ran out of the basement and told the higher up that was working that night that I didn't want to go back. 
I ended up going back down to grab the boxes I left behind because I felt guilty. But I didn't see her again. At my new job there were a few houses so old that they were slanted a good 45 degrees. Well they were torn down to build a grocery store and a hardware store which I work at now. This isn't as scary as the last one but it's still eerie to us. Every once in a while there'll be whispers when we're up front alone. It sounds like someone's saying our name. We'll even see the outline of someone walking up front, as if to check out, but once we shoot up to greet them, there's no one there. Late at night when we're about to close, we normally walk the store to check if there are any more customers, so we don't lock them in by accident. Sometimes we'll glance down an aisle and see a few people clear as day, but on our way back up front, there's no one there. We'll even ask the person at the cash register if anyone walked up front, but they deny seeing anyone besides us. This has left some of the night crew with an eerie feeling. With that final story, the man places his papers back into his briefcase, closes it and stares at you, the unsettling grin never leaving his face. It's at that moment you realise you've never seen him blink. His eyes stare deep into your soul until you flinch and look away from him just for a second. When you look back, the man is gone. There was no way he could have made it out of the carriage. He simply vanished leaving you with the realisation that just because he is gone, your strange night isn't at an end. You are still on this train. You don't know how you got here. And worst of all, you don't know where you're going. <laughs>